Dr. Dave. And, uh, yeah, I do remember the SSC. And I think Dr. Myra Brinkus also told me that uh, she was also one of my students in the SSC. Not her alumnus, and yeah, okay. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in this very same lecture hall. Uh, I've taken many exams in the same lecture hall on the same chairs. So it's always uh, really um, not only fun, uh, but it's also you know, lots of good and lots of good memories in this lecture hall. Um, so thank you for having me um, this afternoon. Uh, when I first uh, thought about um, this particular occasion, I thought we were going to have a small group. I think I told Dr. Rodriguez, you know, if there are only a handful of students, we need to sit around and do a discussion. Um, and then the among us said, okay, we'll make it a, uh, a seminar. But I still wanted to keep it as a discussion and um, really as much as possible uh, a thought or a discussion that would be most helpful to all of you, uh, especially the students, whatever stage of, of your student life. Um, so then I thought, okay, let me talk about life, work, and passions and some insights that I learned along the way. So it's not really a technical seminar. I gave a, a, another seminar this morning that was more technical. So this should be more fun, right, uh, this talk. And hopefully we'll have more time um, to give up for questions and answers. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's get started. Yeah. Um, let's start. Okay, so part of this is asking where this all came from. And when I say this, I mean this love for science and engineering. Uh, and this was four years ago in Philippine Science High School, and I was a freshman sitting in an auditorium. And the guest speaker for that uh, welcoming ceremony was uh, Dr. Dolores Villanueva. Those of you who don't know her, she is a national scientist, uh, but at that, that time, you know, we didn't know that. She just talked about science and her passion, and I thought, wow, this is cool. And, and 40 years later, I still remember the impact that her talk uh, was on me, right? And I said, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be, of course, I was in Philippine Science High School, and it was kind of like a, a pretty accomplished that I would go to science. Um, and I always wanted to be an engineer. My father was a mechanical engineer, and it seemed to me that he could explain many, many things. Uh, and he knew almost everything, or so I thought, right? And I would ask something, he would have an answer. And I thought, engineers are you know, really smart, and they know the answers, and I want to be that kind of person. So I wanted to point back to this talk from 40 years ago, uh, CBAR, and she's actually from you know, UPLD. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, this. This is a toilet. Uh, and if you watch my TED talk, you will see the same toilet. I've been promoting this toilet for 10 years now. Uh, this, is a, this is my favorite toilet in our house um, for a variety of reasons. So, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I do with sanitation and I talked to Rio said uh, crap. But first, we're going to have a quiz. Okay? Did you have a quiz today already? No? Yeah? Okay, well, that was a quiz. Okay. So we have five, uh, the six pictures, and they were taken from five different countries. So this is a matching game. Okay? Matching game. So uh, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, let's just do this by, by, I guess, by raising your hand or by voice. Okay, A, uh, which country is that from? So your choices are. Japan, South Africa, England, and India. All right. Uh, a is from. I think it's it's not the country is not there. <laughs> I know. No, it's there. It's there. It's not a quiz. It's a, it's a real quiz. You have five choices. England. England. Okay, so you want consensus? Okay. A is England. B is easiest, maybe. B is Japan. Japan. Okay. okay, and then C. Okay, lower, lower that. C is from where? I hear Japan, South Africa. Okay, 
about B. D. India. D. India. What about what about E? Okay. So let me tell you the answers. So A is actually South Africa. It's a prototype toilet from a company that wants to upgrade into trees in South Africa. B is Japan. Okay, everybody got that, right? It's got the quality thing. And um, there's a lot of for uh, the bidet, right? And the technical term is anal fencing. Okay? So it's a bidet, and, and sometimes it's also gendered. In other words, if you're, a, if you're male and you push the wrong bottom, it treats wrong, right? <laughs> And then it also has it also has water, it has air, you know, sometimes it's heated. So, okay. And then C is actually from South Africa. This is a picture I took by on a, on a nice safari. They have this nice uh, facility. Thanks. E is India. This is actually in one of the five-star hotels in Chennai, and it's it's one of the grandest uh, uh, restrooms I've ever been in. It's marble all around it's under the ceiling. And then D, uh, this is like a trick question. This is actually in the United Kingdom, in England. This is the Tower of London. Okay, so in the old days, they have what's called a burner room. And what this is, is basically um, uh, an outside room. And so when you do your business, the hole goes outside the wall of the castle and into the moat. You know the moat around the castle, right? Okay. So basically, it's. Uh, it's kind of like an extension of the wall, and then the fecal sludge, the human waste, goes down the side of the wall into the moat. So the moat is pretty used for defense, right? But in the Tower of London, they cover that up because you can imagine the stains on the outside of the wall, right? So they just, you can't see that, but that's the, the old weather room. Okay, so the next slide. So, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about my life necessarily, but it's a little bit self oh, sorry, go back. A little bit self-indulgent, right? In the sense that I also want to give you an idea of, uh, of a little bit of my journey uh, because I think that's important to understand where I'm coming from. So it started here. It's very same campus and, and agricultural engineering. And then I went to Iowa State University. I actually did teach here for two years. That's why I was teaching uh, inside 16 and I also taught NSI 17, Mathematics, I don't know if they teach it still or maybe not. Uh, I did a few other classes. Um, I did my MS in Civil Engineering from Iowa State and then my PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Illinois. Okay, next slide. And so at the end of this, I basically was doing a lot of wastewater treatment plant design. I was, uh, I felt an expert in biological processes in wastewater treatment. Um, and they are important to stay protect public health, right? And so this is an example of a giant wastewater treatment plant. It's called a centralized facility. You have sewers that go into this plant. You've got biological, chemical, physical processes that treat the wastewater. And that was where I specialized, especially the biological part. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little about insights. Okay, so insight. One, be so good they can't ignore you. Okay, uh, and it's exactly what it, what it means. In other words, if you are so good, right, in that thing that you feel is important, whatever that thing is, so good that the world cannot ignore you. I think that should be the goal, right? Because if you want to create impact, you want to have a lasting impact, um, then you don't want to be mediocre. Okay. And how do we how do we actually do this? I mean, that's quite like a big statement. So let's let's think about how we can do this. So the first thing is is basically how do you get better at anything? How do you get better at piano? or the violin, or running, or anything else, or dancing, or singing. You practice, right? So the first thing is, you practice. Okay, and there's a book, um, 
on, on the state of flow, a little bit disturbed because of flow state, where you're at the state where time passes quickly and you're in the, in the zone. You think you would, you know, basketball players talk about being in the zone, right? Everything they shoot seems to go in. They forget about the passage of time. They're basically in sync with what they're doing. There's a book uh, that was popularized, I think, by uh, uh, Malcolm Bell, and it's the 10,000 hours, uh, uh, I guess, hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard of this, right? How long do you need to practice? One study said about 10,000 hours. So, but is this true? You know, actually there are other studies now that show it's actually less than 10,000 hours. The important thing is not so much the hours, or the hours are important, but actually the type of practice. And so what's needed is called deliberate practice. So what does that mean? It's practice where you get feedback on what you're not doing well. So that you can practice it again. In other words, so here's the example. You're playing the piano. So, I don't play the piano, so this is an example. There are some parts of the piano, the piece, that's easy, okay? That's not what you should practice. You should practice the parts that are hard. When you're practicing the parts that are hard, you should be deliberate about it. In other words, get feedback. What did I do wrong? Let me do it again. Let me do that. What did I do wrong? Let me do that again, right? So it's not necessarily the amount of time but it's the feedback and then the improvement. So it's a cycle, right? You, you iterate through this. And that's true whether it's, again, playing music or doing a sport or doing anything. Uh, and even when you're studying. I just saw this, I guess this is Einstein. And it says there, anyone can be a genius if they pick one specific subject and study it diligently just 15 minutes each day. Uh, well, okay. First of all, diligently, what does that mean? Uh, and I think, to me, that should not just be the 15 minutes, right? It should be the deliberate practice. And then when you're doing this, you're going to get to a plateau. You always have, uh, you can plot this, right? Your proficiency on the y-axis is this time. So you're going to practice, you get to a point where, oh, okay, I, I can play a few chords with guitar, right? And with three, four, five chords, I can play a song. But it's not very good, right? So you're going to plateau. You got to push through that plateau. If you want uh, to get better, you need a more difficult song, and then it's going to go up a little bit, right? And so on. Most amateurs stop when they hit the plateau. Okay? And if you want to be an expert at something, you got to push through that plateau. And so, I don't know if I'm making any sense. But I'm just trying to share how I think about some of these things, right? So you know this because you, the way you pass uh, inside, I don't know if I have the numbers right, statics, that is two, that is eight, still five credits. Okay. Eleven and twelve. Eleven and twelve. Oh, okay. It was eleven and twelve when I took it, and then they made it five credits, and nobody passed that, so then they get back to eleven and twelve. So statics and dynamics. The way you, you pass statics is what? You practice, you solve the problems, right? And that's how you get to do that, okay? But you should also be saying, okay, what's the difficult part here? What are the most difficult problems here? That's what I should solve, right? I think that's how I survived from dynamics. Yes, 14, I said 14. Is it the, is it still the same number? 14. 14, yeah. I mean, that stuff is hard. It's one of the hardest tasks that I ever took. But what I did was, okay, what don't I understand? What concept is the hardest here? Let me solve that. And the next thing was, at that time, they would also give out example, they would just say, oh, solve problem 14. It was more like, oh, I already solved that problem. Okay, so sometimes I got out like that. But the point is, uh, you're not there to answer the easy questions, you're there to practice you know, the hard questions if you want to get better at that thing. So that's, that's the problem. Okay, so that's one, one insight. Next. Next insight. Don't start with follow your passion. Maybe you've heard this before from other people. Follow your passion. Right? Okay, I'm going to flip that around. I'm going to say, you don't know what your passion is. 
right? Most people don't know what their passion is at a young age. You actually find your passion along the way. Okay? So don't think, oh, I'm going to be, I don't want to be a, an engineer because I'm an artistic person. Or I don't want to be an artist because I'm, you know, I'm good at numbers. Well, you don't know that yet. Right? Unless you try something, you don't know if you're going to like it, if you're going to be good at it. Right? So it's almost like try a bunch of different things. Right? And then get better at the things that you think you want to enjoy. But don't talk about all your passions yet. It's, it's too early. Okay? If you talk to many people, none of the, uh, the uh, uh, well, I'm going to make a big statement. Maybe very few of the older people here knew that they were going to be what they are right now when they were young. I, certainly, I didn't know I was going to be doing you know, like program ecology, when I was sitting here taking an exam in hydraulics, right? So the idea is to be open about things and try different things, okay? And don't pigeonhole yourself into being passionate about just a few things. Okay, so that's the first thing. So don't start with all your passion. Another example. Uh, who are some of the greatest people or most, uh, I don't know, not greatest, but people that are famous for doing something very, very well? Um, Steve Jobs. Everybody knows who Steve Jobs is, right? I mean, he wasn't a computer genius when he started up. He was actually a college dropout, right? He took a class in calligraphy, and that's why in, on the Mac or the Apple system, you have different fonts. Right? It's not necessarily as New Roman because the guy took a calligraphy class. Okay, he did yoga, he did a lot of different things. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to build a, a, a very a world class computer company. He didn't start doing that. He was just taking things, and it was stated that he found his passion. Right? And if you talk to any of the old guys here, uh, maybe they will say, I knew that I wanted to be a chemical engineer when I was young. But I'm also going to say that along the way you made decisions and now you're at a place where it was very different uh, from what you thought it was going to be. Okay. Okay. okay, so what do we need to do? First, get the skills. That's what we need to do. Okay? Fundamentals first. If the foundations are strong, you can do a lot of different things. This is a game called Jenga, right? You know this game. Right? If the foundation is weak, it's all going to fall. And the nice thing about being in engineering is that the foundations are going to be hammered into you, right? It's a very good foundation. So I started with agriculture and engineering. And I'd like to say, at that time, it was a five-year course. It still is. Course, yeah. It was 187 units. What is it now? 150, 160, 161, right? So we had 187 at that time. So it was five years. But we took classes in not just hydraulics, but also things like thermodynamics, but farm electrification. We had two like electrical engineering classes. And so you know, the foundation is pretty strong. And even today, you know, my, I feel my hydraulics is still quite strong. I feel like my, you know, my physics background is still quite strong. That's because of the foundation. It's a strong foundation, you can go out of the business. So first, the skills, okay? So don't specialize very quickly. Build a foundation that's gonna be strong so you can do different things later on. Does that make sense? Okay, so next. Insight one point B. Be comfortable being different. Okay, when everybody else is doing the same thing, step back and say, okay, how do I actually think about this in a different way? Okay, and you have to be comfortable in that, right? Because if you're going to change the world or try to change the world, you're going to have lasting impact. And I'm assuming that's what you want to do. Then you have to think. That I, I need to be different. I need to think about really uh, doing things from a different perspective. 
Not just for the sake of being different, but if you are different, that's okay. Just accept the fact. It's fine. I don't think the same way. Or I, you know, I stand out because I believe in this or that. Or, you know, people think that uh, I'm out of touch or out of place. That's okay. Be comfortable with being different. One of the things that um, I basically on social media. We were talking about this over lunch. Right? I think social media makes it um, very hard to be yourself in many ways because you're always looking at what other people are eating, what other people are doing, what other people are accomplishing, and it's like that's not a barometer of your life, right? Even this ranking system things, I always don't like it. I actually am going to write an article on that uh, and say, why are we obsessed with with uh, UP versus Adineo on whatever ranking, university ranking, right? I mean, it's pretty arbitrary. I mean, if you really look at, for example, to the US, the US News and World Report rankings, it's, it's bogus. It doesn't make any sense. 50% of the rankings based on reputation. And basically, it's, it's other people judging your program. And they don't really know a whole thousand engineering programs in the US. They just, you know, they just base it on reputation from whatever. And so the well known schools are always well known. It's a vicious cycle, right? It's really not based on any objective. There are things that you cannot quantify. Okay, you cannot quantify certain things, and, and they mostly want the things you cannot quantify actually. So don't obsess with this ranking thing. I mean, that to me is just focusing on the wrong thing. You know, focus on the quality of the work, the quality of the education you're getting, um, and, and and I think the rest is just bragging rights, right? I mean, if it's a basketball game, yeah, I mean, points are going to but if it's something subjective, that doesn't really matter in the long run. Okay? That doesn't mean you don't have metrics, and that doesn't mean you don't have goals that you can quantify. It just means focus on the right quantification schemes. Don't, don't quantify the, the things that are really not quantified. And don't play the game. You know? And even at this, like, I'm not gaming you. Grades, GPA. Uh, don't play that game. You know? Do well because you want to do well. Understand the material because you want to understand the material because you think it's important. It's you know you, you really enjoy learning it, and the grades will follow. And if the grades don't follow, it doesn't matter, right? When you get old like me, nobody asks me what my grades were, right? So so don't worry too much. Right now, the a lot of stress on on you and your folks, right? The times we live in, there's so much. Um, stress and, and mental health issues, and you know, don't, don't play the game of expectations, don't play the game of pressure. Not from your parents, not from your professors, not from anybody, right? It should be the game that you want to play is the game that you want to play. Okay, so you want a professor. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, be comfortable with being different. I don't know if that makes any sense. These are all my insights, so sorry, you can make do that. And if you don't agree, that's fine too, right? Okay? Don't be afraid of sticking out. Don't be afraid of sticking out. That's the beauty of the university. You have diversity. And right? is here. And that's why I love UPLB. It's not like at the NAO, where most people come from a certain demographic. Here in UPLB, we have people from all over, you know, from the provinces, from the city folk. And it doesn't matter. That was a, an undergrad. It didn't matter if you were from Metro Villa and you, you know, you had nice clothes. I don't really care. Right? It didn't matter if you were from the province and you don't have any money. Nobody cares. Right? And that's what I like about those lines. UPLB, to me, is still very, very. Uh, genuinely, very authentic, and I hope it still is the same. Okay, so next, be comfortable with failure. If you're gonna stick out, if you're gonna try something new, you're gonna fail. So my mantra here is: fail, 
fail quickly, fail often, fail cheaply. In other words, it's okay to fail if the stakes are not very high. Right? Failure actually builds your resilience, and failure actually makes you better for the high stakes things. The low stakes things is okay. So be comfortable with failure. Right? And again, this society is telling us, you know, you have to achieve, you have to not fail. And that's not true, it's the opposite. Fail now. You know, fail when it doesn't matter. So when it does matter, then it's, you're fine. You're used to it and it doesn't, you know, doesn't phase you. Okay? Uh, so next. Okay, so a little bit about this long term. Just as an example, okay? So I told you the little bit start here. It started with UPLB and BS I Group of Engineering. And then the next decision was to major in Laurea, land and water resources. Okay, because I like water, I like you know, hydraulics, I even though I also like machineries, I thought it was you know land and water was where I wanted to be. And then the next decision, and again I didn't know any of these, right? It's one of those things where you go along the road, okay, and you build your foundation. And you just make decisions that make sense. And the next decision was, okay, I don't want really to talk about irrigation or drainage. I really want water quality. To me, water is life, right? The issue is the environment, to make sure that water is something safe to drink and so on, right? Safe to put in the environment. And after that, it was, okay, I want to do actually wastewater. Because I think that's the dirtiest water, right? And I want to make, understand how to make that clean. And then the next was, okay, within wastewater, the most exciting part to me was biological processes. Not the chemistry, it was more the biology. So then turned into the next thing, which was microbial ecology and microbiology. Right? And I, my last, uh, I only took like, I don't know, bio two years. Right? And now I was taking gas in microbiology. And it was just again one of those things, and just made decisions along the way. And then the next was, okay, biotechnology. Now I'm going to go do things with DNA and RNA. Really understand some of these new techniques. Um, which led to working with products and sanitation and now thinking about global sanitation. Right? Because I was an expert in giant waste logical plants, in design of systems. But then I realized, I always knew this, that a large portion of the world, 3.6 billion people, actually don't have access to uh, safe sanitation services, right? Almost 50%. So, so the designs and the things that I was teaching, they didn't really apply to the rest of the world. And coming from the Philippines, I knew that. I knew that the developing world had a different set of conditions. So why am I teaching all of these high tech stuff, right? So I wanted to think about global sanitation. Then today, I'm thinking about environmental justice and, and equity and how long our systems are really not benefiting those who need it the most. Right? So if I, if I look at this, so I made this uh, slide maybe uh, a couple of days ago. And when I look at this, I never would have predicted that I would have touched these things when I was your age sitting in this lecture hall. Right? I, it was just a journey, and you know, sometimes it's by accident, and they just end up in a place. And you don't look back, you don't play this, uh, you know what I mean? Oh, fear of missing out. You know, you don't say, what if, what if. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just make the best decisions, and then as you go out of the way, you know, again, if you're doing deliberate practice, you're being so good that the world can ignore you, you're going to be fine. Right? In whatever arena you want to be in. And it doesn't really have to be globally good, right? The best in the world. Again, those rankings, they don't matter. Those awards, they don't matter. Right? They, they will come, but that's not the point. You know, if you do your job and you try to be the best that you can be, those other things will follow. Okay? Okay, so next. Okay, so, so my goal is to work in, in wastewater treatment, and I want to understand the system. Um, and so my lab is really looking at this 
drum box, where engineering meets microbiology. And I want to get that interface. Right? So I am an engineer, but also I'm a microbiologist or a pretty one. And so I can actually go between those two those two fields. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, this whole idea is, is called structure function analysis, meaning the microbial community structure defines the function. So that box there is my reactor, that means my system. And I have inputs and I have outputs. And I, as an engineer, I'm interested in the outputs and I'm interested in the inputs. But I also want to understand what's going on inside. Okay, so this is where right now I have to look at the microorganisms, the microbial populations, the interactions, and, and those kinds of things. And I apply this kind of framework to all kinds of environments. Um, like activate search, anaerobic reactors, and using different kinds of tools. So molecular biological tools, modeling tools, mathematical tools, um, whatever is needed to understand what's going on inside the box. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit more detail. Uh, in a little bit. Okay, so the third insight um, is that go back to the insight to yeah, exciting things happen at the interface. Okay, so when you're combining different fields, that is when you might have a large potential for growth. Okay, so those the exciting things are always at the interface. Thanks. Okay, so this is an interface between environmental engineering and, and microbiology. And we're using this so that we can have applications, whether it's converting waste to resources, converting waste to energy, protecting public health, uh, you know, helping out with, with climate change, and, and so on. So, uh, this is one simple Venn diagram where we have environmental engineering, interfacing with microbiology, and then you have global sanitation also. So this morning I talked about the project kind of like in the middle uh, of, of all three uh, I forget now that we talk about it. Oh, yeah. ah, okay, so this is an intersection of public health and engineering um, and also microbiology. So when the pandemic hit, um, maybe you've heard about this, but we can now test the presence of SARS CoV 2 in wastewater, right? So the idea there was okay, we know that people are shedding uh, SARS CoV 2 in their Pieces and in uh, and in urine, but mostly in the pieces. And so, if we can, if we can actually um, sample and detect it in wastewater, then we can say something about the community, right? So it's not necessarily checking each particular individual uh, for you know the COVID virus. So this one example where we were ready to do this very early on in the pandemic. Right, because we were seeing an interface. We had the tools, the molecular techniques, we had the know-how. We didn't necessarily have all the equipment. Uh, so some of them are quite expensive, like digital gloves and PCR. But we knew how to do this. And also we knew the wastewater side of things. Right? So it was quite easy to put together all the, the pieces to get a fund, a funding, research funding, and then do this. And a lot of people thought the same way, right? So this is now called wastewater epidemiology. So what we ended up doing was actually setting up this system for uh, the state of North Carolina, which then became part of a national water surveillance system in the US and is funded by the CDC now. And so this is one of those things where being at that interface really made us ready to do this. And we felt like we were doing something during the pandemic that might help society. Okay, so so the other concept of interfaces is what I call the adjacent possible. Um, and it's not, it's not my uh, concept, but when you're in a field and you're pushing against the edges at the forefront or the leading edge of research, okay, it's like popping up and, and, and floating, uh, you know, pushing your head up and seeing right, what else is next, what's the adjacent possible, right? What that means is you're looking at what is close to your field, right, but at the leading edge of your field. And that's how you make insights. That's how you push to the top here. Okay? 
So a classic example is you walk into a room and the room has many doors. Okay? You open one door, you walk in, that next room has many doors. You open one door, you walk in, and so on, right? You're basically just walking into the adjacent room, but before you know it, you have already, you know, traveled a long way, and you have covered a lot of territory. You didn't know what you were going to do next, you just knew it was adjacent to where you were. Does that make sense? Okay, so what's the adjacent possible now in your view? What is out there that when you poke your head up and you look around, right, that's close to my field right now, okay? So some of you are in agricultural engineering, right? So you're in processing or machinery, hope I suppose it's through the right categories, yeah. or land and water resources. Okay. I'm gonna say that for any field of engineering, the adjacent possible is now data, right? And how we handle data. You heard about AI, you heard about machine learning, but that's the adjacent possible for a lot of different fields. Okay? What about uh, the human tech interface? That's the adjacent possible for many fields. Engineers working with social scientists, engineers thinking about culture, not just technology, but actually how people use technology. Okay, that's the case possible. What about issues of equity? Who is benefiting from this technological achievement? That's the case possible for some people. Right? So think about that, right? When you're at the leading edge, how many actually expand and walk into the next room? So hopefully that makes sense. Yes. Okay, inside three. Aim for autonomy. The freedom to choose what you want to work on. If you had a choice, let's say between job one and job two, okay, one of your criteria should be which job here is to get your autonomy. If you had a choice between taking, uh, I don't know, choice one versus choice two, okay, position one versus position two, always consider the autonomy factor. Okay. Which position would allow me to do what I want to do? Okay, and not just follow what we told what to do. Okay? Because that gives you the greatest degrees of freedom. Literally degrees of freedom. Because you don't know where you're gonna end up, right? And again, a strong foundation helps. Because if you have a strong foundation, you can do anything. Your engineering degree, I've known engineers who were lawyers, who became lawyers, engineers who became doctors. Engineers who became business people, right? Your engineering degree is a very good degree of freedom. You made a good choice, right? I mean, if you were in, I don't know the name other than majors, but uh, if you were in some field of humanities, that's not STEM, for example, right? You might have a narrower focus, but maybe not. Maybe I'm speaking, maybe that's wrong, okay? Uh, so next. Okay, so I wanted to work on, on toilets. Uh, but in my job, allow me to do that. Which is one of the nice things about being an academic. I can choose the problems that I want to work on. Okay, I worked already on uh, microbial ecology, microorganisms, molecular methods, right? I wanted to work on toilets. And so, yeah, let's just work on toilets. I know a lot about wastewater. Right? I know a lot about human waste, and so let's do that. Uh, so these are pictures from uh, Malawi and South Africa and, and Ghana, uh, and just learning, learning the field. And I was fortunate to, um, to get a, a grant from the AIDS Foundation to really start working in, in some of these areas. It's, you know, not everybody has two toilets. This is called a hanging toilet or hanging machine. Essentially, you do your business, it goes to the water, right? That water is dirty, as you can see, and then take this picture. Um, and, and the rest of the environment is very dirty. And so the question also is, do I want to live in a world where this is happening? It's 2022, right? You have smartphones, you have all the technology, and yet you've got billions of people living like this, right? And as an environment engineer, 
this should not do. This, this doesn't sit well, right? I should do something about this. And I think I have, again, the foundations to do something about it, uh, at least in terms of the research right, and the technology. So these are the numbers. 3.6 billion of the access to safety managed sanitation services. In other words, you might have a little bit, but then their waste is largely untreated. Uh, think about Metro Manila. We were trying to visit Dr. Lord Laguna in UPLP. Where does the waste go? Is it properly treated before it's discharged? And then it goes to the lake, right? We have the largest septic tank in the world, the Lake Laguna. We go to the lake, the largest septic tank. Metro Manila is the same thing, right? Metro Manila is about 20% sewer, and all of that uh, wastewater goes to functioning wastewater treatment plants. But 70 to 80 percent is essentially septic tanks, but they're not properly designed septic tanks, they're just holding tanks. Mike, if I ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've stayed in Saba for quite some time, and most of the houses have state houses built on the shoreline, right? And I've seen the toilets, they just squat and right. drop the. Yep, so that's like this. Yeah. Those, uh, no, so I, I like to ask you. How are you going to solve this global sanitation of the future? Why not? Why Alright, so the question is, how do we solve this global sanitation issue? Right. Oh. So I have another problem on that, <laughs> which is another one to cover. Because we've analyzed some of the uh, some of the issues. But the, the short answer is, it's not just technology. Okay, there are 40 things for global sanitation that we need to address. One is the enabling environment. And by that, I mean the political will to set up regulations, to set up laws in the country. Because as long as it's okay to do that, as long as there are no penalties, people will do that. Right? It's really regulations that are going to stop this. So we need laws in the, an enabling environment, a country, a city, a town that says this will not do. Right? But it's political will, so far. That's the first. The second is technology. When we talk about technology, it's not just the toilet, but a long sanitation chain. I think I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. The third is um, economic incentives. We're talking about 3.6 billion people in the world. We want to make sure that our solutions are scalable. And the best way to do scale is if somebody's taking a profit out of it, right? If, if every step of the way, or maybe not every step, but the, the whole chain somebody makes a profit out of that, that will scale up. Otherwise, it's always going to be subsidies, right? And then the last is um, behavior change. We've got to, in some of these areas, you know, we really need to think about uh, hygiene and hand washing and our beliefs and behaviors around sanitation. That's why I talk about this, right? Because a lot of people don't want to talk about shit. Okay, and I'm like, everybody shits. Right? And if all of us didn't care what happened to our ship, the world could be even dirty. And, and so we need to talk about this. That's part of the behavior change. And, you know, uh, what we need to do. And you see that with COVID, right? Everybody's washing their hands, you know, and doing protective measures. So but I can go into detail on those things, but it's a whole other, I think a whole lot. <laughs> okay, so next slide. This is the sanitation service chain. So you've got the, the user interface in the front of the toilet. You may have containment or storage, and then you might have transportation, and then treatment, and then end use, maybe disposal, maybe reuse. Okay, what's happening is that we only look at the front end. We don't look at the rest of the chain. The rest of the chain is invisible to us. We touch it, and we hope it goes to the right sewer line, to the right channel. Right? The rest is hidden. Uh, in some countries, it's not hidden. They actually have to pump it out of the truck or maybe by hand, right, manually, and they have to take it to a treatment plant. So, we think about technologies, we have to think about the technologies all along this chain. So, we both a few steps on this chain, now or that, but we need technology along the way. And, and not just technology, but also how we think about the service itself, the service provision. Next. So here's an example of manual fit entry. And this is still happening today. 2022, you've got iPhones, you've got smartphones, you've got Wi-Fi. But we still have people 
actually do this as part of your work. Right? I did not think it's picture is uh, any picture of the thing from working in the hospital. Highly undignified, it's dangerous, right? The line here is exposed to all the pathogens. And it's still, it's still going on. And that is to be one of the things that's wrong in this world, right? And some people have a lot, and then some people do this. And there's something fundamentally wrong, you know. And if we can solve this, again, more things. The think environment, technology be on the toilet, economic incentives, opportunities, and then uh, cultural behavioral change. You know, we can think about a solution for this dramatic. Example of the work that we've done. So I'm talking about the pit empty part, right? So how do we empty those pits without people actually going down there? Well, this is the summarizing about 10 years of prototyping. Only about fail, you know, cheaply. All right, so you go to the lab, you build something, you think you have something good, go to the field, test it, you fail again. You can see the different prototypes. It started with like a screw over, and it became more like a vacuum, it became more like a, a flexible hose, a vacuum system, and now it's, it's, it's something called, we call the excluder. And we learned a lot along the way. We learned that this is hard, we learned that the conditions are very, very different. And, and that uh, we need to be always creative with all sorts of things. So this is an example of how we think about prototyping and testing. So now this is called the excluder. And uh, and part of changing the environment is talking about these things, right? Talking about sanitation. Maybe it's not very sexy, you know, we're not talking nanotechnology here or laser or whatever. We're talking about shit. And you know, part of me, part of my job is to actually do this. And I talk to high schools, I talk to grade schools, you know, wherever people invite me, I go and we talk about these things. Um, and in addition, I have a I, oh, yeah, so this is the Red X group that we, we want, and then, um, yeah, next slide. And then I have, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dead Ed. Uh, so it's animated videos from the, the dead folks also. And so this one is on the history of blood. And actually I like this format more because this thing now has, I don't know, like three and a half million views. Um, and I have another one coming out soon on water reviews. Uh, and really it's a great format because I, I'm reaching the, the younger people, the elementary school children, you know, with this, with this format. And so being just being talking about it, just being vocal about some of these issues, I think is part of my part of my job. And then at NC State, we uh, I was fortunate to lead. Um, I proposed this to the provost, and then I got faculty positions, four faculty positions to build a Google Watch cluster at NC State. And so we have people, we have social scientists, we have epidemiologists. And an engineer working on, on water and sanitation. Next, okay, inside four. Uh, a purpose beyond yourself, right? Uh, all of this is boiling down to why. Why are we doing this? Why are we, why are we studying hard? Why are we doing it today? Right? And if you keep asking why, you will go beyond the first layers. Like, I want to have a job. I want to feel secure. I want to be, you know, established like in a family. Right? You keep asking why, it's going to come down to the really big whys. And so, to me, it's a purpose beyond yourself. And you will find your purpose. And that actually then makes life, you know, uh, worth living. So, so there's this concept by Daniel Kay um, called autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Maybe some of you have heard about this. This is an example uh, from Cortex City, uh, Javi Law versus Javi Kay, right? in the context of autonomy, mastery, purpose. So, Javi Law, you have a feeling of control. 
economy. Mastering your feel like you're using your full potential and you're growing. You're, you're good at something. Right? You feel good about doing something if you know you're good at it. The purpose feels like it makes a difference to you. Okay, that's the job you love. The company great is somebody else is controlling you. You're not growing, you're stagnating, you're not really good at what it is, and then your work doesn't matter, doesn't make any money. Okay. So it's easy to remember autonomy and three purpose. And you can use that best for a lot of different things. But this is the most you know, great autonomy, right? I'll be starting about mastering skills, feeling in control, and being the, the greatest, the best you that you can be. And then purpose is just making an impact, just really mattering. So I think that's a good place to think about. And then uh, some more things to ponder. Okay, to ponder. The last one. Care about the things you care about. Okay, what does this mean? You care for your life. So that means you spend time in your life. You care about your life. You spend energy, you spend time, you focus. There are so many things going on in the world. I'm having this passion, right? I'm having it's all over, right? Some things you should not care about at all, right? You should not care about the top of rankings. You should not care about that so much. But you should not care about what other people think of you sometimes. Sometimes you have to think about what other people think of you, but sometimes you don't, right? And if you don't care about things, then don't care about them. In other words, prioritize your life. Right? Things are important. Care about the things you care about. If you care about your studies, focus on your studies. If you care about your relationship, focus on your relationship. Okay? And other things you don't care too much about, then don't spend time doing that. Don't spend time wasting your time on, on social media. Right? I, I don't have a Twitter account. I'm glad I don't, because if I had a Twitter account, I would shut it down right now. But I really did, because I don't really care. About having followers and whatnot. It's not important. Okay. So, this culture is uh, being a Kardashian culture. Influencer. I don't know what the heck an influencer is. Do you agree that he who holds the gold makes the gold? So, the question is do I agree that he who gold makes the gold makes the rules? I mean, you say that. You you are you think if you are to go and be that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you might expect anything in the university to have policies that you have to Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm not saying that um you should aim for total autonomy, right? To revolve our bodily rules. I think what I'm saying is if you have a choice between the say a job, say talking, you have a job, maybe it's higher pay, okay? Or the job is lower pay. Okay, but this one job, you feel you can grow. The other job, your boss will let you try different things. The other job, you have some time to try and experiment. To me, that carries some weight. And you should consider that, not just the other thing, right? So that's what I mean. I'm not saying you are out of control, you all have to follow rules. But, uh, you know, what we need is like, I derive some satisfaction from what I do is it's self-directed. Okay? And it's not just me doing whatever you tell me to do. Because you know, and there are some jobs that unfortunately that's it. You just do one thing and that's it. But you're not that, right? You're not you're not preparing to be uh, a worker who's following all the time. You are preparing to be leaders. Right? It's, it's a very select understand that you are privileged, right? You are a very select group. You're in the upper one percent already of, of people in the Philippines at your age. Why? You're a UV, you're an engineering, right? I mean, you're much better than the 99 percent And so you are preparing to be leaders, and you're preparing to be, you know, you're not preparing to just be workers. So, so 
This is not a factory for producing workers. This is an institution for producing engineering leaders and the leaders of our society tomorrow in the future. Okay? So it's not just about landing a job, it's not just about making money. It's about thinking about your role um, in this society. Okay, so it's okay, so on. Happiness comes from facing problems. So you know all about this because you went to static dynamics. Right? Happiness comes from solving this hard thing and coming out of the other end and saying, Oh, I, I think I'm understanding this. I'm getting a solution as well. I think it's it's clicking, right? And I do it again, and when it clicks, that's where happiness comes. Right, and so the things like a business, if you don't have problems, you're not going to appreciate what happiness is. <laughs> That's why you can't face it. Problems. Like if you have, if you have oh, problems, it can't make that our mind. That's the thing I so what I, want to say, what I want to say here is basically don't be afraid of poverty. You know, yeah. When I came to Rosbatan, I came from Vietnam. When I came to Rosbatan, I, I was really surprised. When they have when they exist organic from practice organic, they are something all of them. Because the guy who has no practice should be at the main time hospital. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, but, well, I just want to say that don't aim for a life that's problem free. Okay, don't aim for a life that's problem free. Aim for a life where you're solving problems. See the difference? And if you have been able to solve yeah, and then you move on to the next thing. Yeah, and you know, good diet. That's why I'm not talking this time. I think I want to I always succeed. Okay, so the happiness comes from struggles. Okay, it's the journey, it's the it's the many hours that you are solving that aesthetic problem. Okay, believe it or not. That struggle, you know, that happiness must be that. And again, if there's no struggle, there's no happiness. You take it for granted. You know, when you want to leave this, uh, what is your You want to leave this, uh, people don't want to bow. Because this is the last of the people. This is the last of the people. They never work an the entire day in their life. They're always privileged. They're always rich. Right? And they'll never be happy for a while. Number two, they really won't be able to do much. They never, they don't know how to work, right? You should look for leaders who work and actually leaders who, you know, just prove that they work, right? You know, you know, well, a homestead, I don't know, you need an exit in the network, but I don't know, they should not be here because they basically are. You know, how does that that they actually can accomplish anything, especially for society? So, I, I, I think that's what that's the point here, right? And as, as engineering students, you're used to this. I think when you're doing engineering, and you're doing engineering, and when you finish, or you're all on the other side, when you graduate, you'll be proud, proud of yourself. You accomplished something. And if you think struggle, it won't mean as much. Yeah? So, what do you think of personal? What kind of things are that? That's, I think, that's what I need there. I think it's not from Okay, maybe go to the workshop, maybe the other next. So, what problems do you want to struggle with? What, what problems do you want to solve? That's really the question, right? You have a choice. What problems do you want to solve? Global sanitation. <laughs> Global sanitation. 
I didn't know I was trying to solve that or see that that's the problem that I want to solve, but I ended up there. And maybe you don't know, right? Maybe you just have a better idea of what's going on. That's okay. Don't worry too much about it. But be aware that you know you're deciding, you know, uh, in the end what problems you want to solve. 